what? Mi gardena in yer dagum, theo coninga thrim ye frunon, huda athalingas ellen fremedon, oft shield shaving shea dena thriatum, monego madum, meod settle of thea exode eorbos, sudan ares worth, thea fundin, hedas frofre yabad, weax under woknum, worth mundum da, all that him a quilch dara in sitendra over hung rada here on shoulder. Gomban Guldan, that was God Cunning. Those are the opening lines of Beowulf, Beowulf as it was actually written. We spoke in the last Reading Culture video about how the actual text is that written by the author and that we have to receive it through some kind of mediation, the mediation of a translator. But that is why it is very useful to have a facing page translation, even if you cannot read the original language, or indeed understood, understand anything that I just said. If for only to remind you that you are indeed reading a translation and not the original. Now, if you got a sense of the kind of, you know, separation between yourself and uh, that language by you know, being, it being completely incomprehensible to you, you should know that there is also a distance in terms of not only language, which we again, we are mediating by means of a translator, but there is another kind of distance as well that goes even beyond language. And that is of context and not just cultural context, because it is of course the product of a very different culture, but also of literary context, right? We will see as we dive into the very beginning of this poem that we are immediately confronted by literary references which we may not understand. So the lines that I just read for you in the original uh, constitute about the first 10 lines or so. Here are how those same lines, what I just read to you in Old English, here is how they are translated by Dr. Roy Liazza. Listen, we have heard of the glory in bygone days, of the folk kings of the Spear Danes, how those noble lords did lofty deeds. Often shield shathing seized the mead benches for many tribes, troops of enemies, struck fear into earls, though he first was found a waif. He awaited solace for that. He grew under heaven and prospered in honor until every one of the encircling nations over the whale's riding had to obey him, grant him tribute. That was a good king. It's possible that perhaps the only phrase, the only sentence that you actually were able to understand of the original was the final line that I read, that was gold cunning, right? That was a good king. And so we get in these initial lines, the description of a king. Now we are going to return to this later, but we really want to pay very close attention indeed to how this poem starts and the images that it uh, employs. So the very first thing we have is this uh, this interjection, right? This in the old English, it's hot, right? It's translated as listen here. You could also translate it as low or hark uh, to be a little bit more archaic. And it's an example of anacrusis. So anacrusis is the appearance of an additional unstressed syllable or syllables at the beginning of a verse line before the regular metrical pattern begins. So you may remember in the previous video, I talked about how Anglo-Saxon poetry works, and it works not on the basis of rhyme, but on the basis of alliteration, a repetition of sounds, and specifically on stressed syllables. So if we look at this opening line in the original, we can see this, right? We gardena in yer dagum, right? It's on that D sound. And then and the next line, Theod Koninga Thrim Yafrunon, right? It's on that TH sound. And then the following one, following one, uh who the Athalingas Ellen Fremedon. That one might be trickier to understand. It's actually on the vowel sounds. Athalingas Ellen Fremedon, because all vowels alliterate in this scheme. So hot in that first line isn't in that metrical kind of uh, uh, line, right? It's not in that pattern. Uh, it's standing outside of it. Why? Well, it seems that it's to call attention. Again, if you can imagine, imagine those lines that I began reading. Imagine that that is being said in a mead hall, right around a raging fire while people are feasting and drinking, and there's a shawl, 
uh, as the, is the old English word, word. you know, a, a, a bard isn't actually a great translation, but maybe it may, might be the closest thing that uh, we can think of, right? Who's, you know, he'll have a harp and he'll pluck the harp and he'll start, this would prob probably have been not just told, but, you know, sung or chanted, or at least said in some kind of rhythmic way. And so that hot, that listen is meant to call attention. And this also calls our attention to, again, the possibility, the very real possibility that this kind of a story originates out of oral storytelling. All right. Once we move past that initial call to attention, we get this reference to a character, right? Often shield shaving sees the Mead benches from many tribes. So who is a shield shaving person? Well, if you look at the note, uh, if you have Leo's edition by Broadview Press, you'll see uh, well, the following. The name means shield, son of sheaf, i.e. of grain. So uh, right, uh, the I-N-G ending is basically used for a house, kind of son of, you can think of it that way. Um, the mysterious origins of shield who seems to arrive providentially from nowhere and is returned to the sea after his death has occasioned much critical speculation. Indeed, it seems that right, this shield is the legendary founder of the shielding dynasty, right? And his origin here in the poem seems to be a conflating of the myths that were related to shield, who is probably, again, uh, right, a character who you know, who knows, maybe he, there is some historical basis there, but primarily is a literary character who is meant to account for the existence of what was probably a real historical tribe, the Shieldings. But he's given the origin of Shafe here. So you note that uh, 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 Shafe, Ing means son of Shafe, which means sheaf, and it specifically would be a sheaf of grain. So the original myth of Shafe is that this child arrives in a boat out of the sea, probably the Western Sea, with nothing but a sheaf of grain in it, uh, with no known origin. He was probably originally an agricultural god, uh, right, a god of grain. And it's interesting here that he is given the same, right, his origin is melded into this legendary character of S.H.I.E.L.D. Right? Again, this character who arrives out of the sea. And it what does this perhaps remind you of, based on what we've been looking at recently, right? Rise mysteriously in a boat out of the sea, and as we will see in a moment, he returns there. Well, that's very much like King Arthur, of course. Remember in The Coming of Arthur, in uh, Tennyson's Idols of the King, right? Again, Arthur comes mysteriously out of the sea and eventually comes back there. Now, there is a difference here in that we have some sense in that poem of where Arthur comes from. We really have no idea where either in the original myth, where uh, Shave comes from, or Shield. Although there is, interestingly, a, uh, a tradition in Anglo-Saxon literature of giving the origin for Shave, who again, probably would have been a god, but after they become Christianized, they actually say that he was a son of Noah, born in the ark. And that gives you a good example of how the literary traditions that the Anglo-Saxons have inherited from their own culture are merged with the literary traditions of Christian culture, which come, came from Europe uh, with the missionaries. So we had this interesting blend here. All right. And how is he described? So he's described as seizing mead benches from many tribes. So to seize mead benches really means to destroy other tribal kings and their halls, right? The hall is really the seat. Again, it's not the castle in this culture. It's the hall is the seat of uh, the kingly power. And it's specifically the giving out of mead, of rewards generally, but mead being one of those rewards, right, to the men who would be sitting around, right, the benches around the king is, is symbolic of that community. So if you're seizing or overturning their mead benches, you're really overturning their power. So he seized uh, their, uh, right, their mead benches, right, he struck fear into earls. So he was first found a waif, right, so he was basically thought of, right, so he was, you know, an orphan. Uh, right, and he awaited solace for that. Right? So there's a sense again that he, he's kind of bereft of, of parentage. So he grew under the heavens, he prospered in honor until every one of the encircling nations over the whales riding had to obey him and grant him tribute. So you'll you'll note here, uh, right? There's a note after whales riding. It says that it's a condensed descriptive image of the sea, which is the riding place of whales. 
uh, and elsewhere the sea is referred to as the gannet's bath or the swan's riding. Now, this is, though, is also an example of a very common poetic and literary feature in Anglo-Saxon. Uh, well, verse, but even uh, more widely in Anglo-Saxon literature. And that is uh, this whale's writings, or in the, uh, in the original is Hran Rada. Uh, this is what is known as a kenning. And a kenning is a pictorial, a pictorial descriptive compound, or a brief description which can be used in place of the normal plain word. So in other words, again, instead of just saying C, you're going to use a, a kind of evocative poetic description, right? Uh, uh, an image, and it's usually a compound, so the, the writing place of the whales. Um, or possibly it might also mean a creature maybe closer to a dolphin. Um, but there's there's a sense that, that, and again, or it's a place where the birds bathe, or it's a place where the swans um, uh, ride, right? All of these various ways to describe it. And this is very common. You'll see this throughout, right? You'll see swords referred to as battle lights. Um, you'll even actually, interestingly, even Beowulf's name itself is a kenning. Beowulf means bee wolf, as in, the bee, so the, right, the, like, like bees and with eyes, right? The, the bee of, uh, or rather the wolf of the bee, sorry. The wolf of, so what is the wolf of the bee? Well, you have to understand that culturally, and it is very common, right? Wolves are known for being kind of thieves, you could almost say, right? They, they, right, they might attack, because they're, they're, you know, the things that might attack and make off with your, you know, lamb or something like that. So, uh, the wolf of the bee is that which steals from the bee. Well, what steals from the bee? Bears. Bears steal from bees. So Beowulf's name means bear, but in a poetic, kenning-like way, in this kind of descriptive way. We'll see that throughout, Beowulf acts in many ways like a bear. He has a tendency to fight without weapons and grapple with them. And anyway, we'll see this as we encounter it. But this is our, our first encounter with a kenning. So uh, we will watch for those throughout. All right, so we, we see that he, he gains this power and that that was a good king, right? He, being able to, you know, defeat your enemies is, is one of the things that makes a king good in this culture. And we see that a boy is later born to him, who's, right, a young, a young child. Uh, that, again, we have our Christian poet kind of adding this in, that God sent this child as a solace to the people because he saw their need. Right, the dire distress that they had had lordless for such a long time. So there's a, a sense that they needed the solace of an heir, right? And the importance of an heir. Again, we will encounter this later um, in this culture because to be lordless, right, is is really a uh, um, a, a fear and a source of societal uh, fragmentation in this culture. And this is going to be explored throughout. And we see it already. Uh, uh, quite early in the poem. We'll see it particularly when we get to the story of Hermod. All right. Um, we also are going to get a uh, another description here, right? The Lord of Life, the wielder of glory, gave him worldly honor. So again, the, the, the Lord of Life is a kenning for God. And, it, and again, it's an example of an intrusion of Christian poetic diction into a pagan context. Now, whether or not the Lord of... Uh, the Lord of Life would have been a kenning that uh, the Anglo-Saxons originally employed, who was Christianized after conversion, or whether or not it's entirely a Christian, uh, an example of Christian diction that's just put back into the text. So we'll, we'll have to get used to seeing these kinds of things throughout, but this, this mix of uh, this kind of Christian narrator in this pagan world. All right, so then we get this interesting reference here. So we have Beowulf, the son of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now we get a note that says that it's not the monster slaying hero of the poem's title, but rather an early Danish king. Many scholars argue that the original name was Beow, and they argue for this because the line as poetically scans better in the Old English if the name of the character is Beow. And it's also less confusing, right? That you wouldn't have two characters named Beowulf. Um, and it would make, in many ways, more sense for a mythical character named Baal, right, uh, meaning barley, to be the descendant of Shaves, right, like corn right, or grain. Uh, so that's uh, that's just interesting to note. So don't be confused. We have not been introduced to the actual character Beowulf yet. All right. So, uh, but we see that this Beowulf or Baal, if you prefer, right, the son of Shield, was renowned. His fame spread wide through uh, Scandinavian land. So again. We have to note that the setting of the action of this poem is thoroughly Scandinavian, right? It's in, again, modern-day Sweden or Norway, Denmark. Uh, it's not English. 
And so again, we talked about this in uh, the previous video, there is this question of uh, why would the English write about Scandinavians, right? Especially since this may originate from a time when uh, England was being raided and attacked by Scandinavians. So these are interesting things to keep in mind. So we once again get to this description of what is a good king, and this will be very important throughout. Well, the young man, uh, it says, Th thus should a young man bring about good with pious gifts from his father's possessions, so that later in life, loyal comrades will stand beside him when more comes. The people will support him. With praiseworthy deeds, a man will prosper among many people, among any people. So we uh, get this emphasis that there's a huge amount of importance placed on properly using the possessions that one has, particularly to dole out to your followers so that they will stick by you. Again, we'll, we'll see throughout this idea of needing loyal companions who won't uh, abandon you. Right. And in this case, these possessions, of course, are received from the father, the king. Again, this idea of reciprocity, which we will see throughout. It's a very much a society and a culture based in reciprocity. Right. The idea of giving and receiving as being the basis of ties of loyalty and kingship. And here also note the parallelism. Right. So we have the uh, the loyal comrades who will stand by him. And with the same object there, the people supporting him. So these are both tied together, the support of the people and the loyal comrade standing by, right? This is what a good king needs to secure, because if he loses these, right, he could lose his, his kingdom and his life. So after this description, we get the uh, the end of Shield's story. It says, a shield passed away at his appointed hour. The mighty Lord went into the Lord's keeping. They bore him down to the brimming sea, his dear comrades, as he himself had commanded, while the friend of the shieldings wielded speech, that dear land ruler had long held power. In the harbor stood a ring-proud ship, icy, outbound, a nobleman's vessel. There they lay down their dear lord, dispenser of rings in the bosom of the ship, glorious by the mast. There were many treasures loaded there, adornments from distant lands. I've never heard of a more lovely ship bedecked with battle weapons and war gear, blades and burnies, which is a kind of... Uh, coat of ringmail. Uh, in his bosom lay many treasures, which were to travel far with him into the keeping of the flood. With no fewer gifts did they furnish him there, the wealth of nations, than those did who at his beginning first sent him forth alone over the waves while still a small child. Then they set a gold ensign high over his head and let the waves have him, gave him to the sea with grieving spirits, mournful in mind, Men do not know how to say truly, not trusted counselors, nor heroes under the heavens who receive that carter. All right, so here in this description, we see that S.H.I.E.L.D. is going to return from the sea, right, from where he came. Right, So he has his origin out in the sea, we don't exactly know where, and he will return there as well. We also get a, another example of uh, Lytotes, right? and there's a note on that, right, there's this, this idea that he was... Um, uh, shield is found destitute, um, right? Which is again a kind of ironic understatement. Uh, which so we'll talk a little bit more about Atotes in, in a minute. But there is this idea that right, Shield comes from nowhere with nothing, and then he builds this uh, great uh, kingdom, and he manages to pass it on to his son, right? Which is the key success, and then he goes back into this kind of nothingness from which he came. Well, see, the Beowulf is also going to not be the son of a king, right, and not have a great kingdom, but he will be able to kind of build that up through his own prowess, somewhat similarly to S.H.I.E.L.D. But his ending, well, in some ways it'll be the same, and in some ways it won't. Again, note that this begins with a funeral. It's also, in many ways, that kind of traditional funeral that you may have seen and many uh, you know, films or stories of the you know, person being placed in a ship. They're usually in films, they light it on fire. So here, we, we, we don't know if this is ever an actual practice. There are examples, for instance, a very famous archaeological find at Sutton Hoo in England, a buried ship with a king buried inside the ship with, again, weapons and rings and treasure and things like that. Uh, whether or not they actually ever put them in boats and set them out into the sea, I don't know. Maybe they decided to carry them back. But the idea is that there's this returning to the point of origin. 
which is is very significant. And then we uh, get out of the prologue. So that is the prologue, which introduces the entire story. And so we're spending a little bit more time on it. We'll see uh, in the next section, section one, uh, that we're going to get a little bit of the background to uh, the actual setting of our story, which will be in Heorot. We, we get an introduction, for instance, to uh, the kind of kingly background. So we get this character, the great Selfdana, at line uh, 57, uh, whose name is Halfdane. He may have been a partially historical character. Um, but interestingly, he's a character that we find in both, both Norse and English legend. So it's an example of all the things going on in this poem. We've already looked at this kind of mix of Christian and pagan. There's also a mix of historical and uh, legendary. So some of these characters, it appears anyway, they, that is to say they show up in what we would consider to be more historical sources. Um, it appears that they actually have some historical basis, right? Halfdane being one of them. But they're elaborated on into legend. But we also see this mix of English and Norse. And again, the English had many legends related to Scandinavia, uh, the English people, the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes would have originally come from the kind of North German area right nearby. So, and they spoke a common language and they had a very common culture. So this isn't perhaps uh, all as foreign as it may indeed seem. And so there's a lot of names that are referenced here in the beginning. We also get uh, uh, right after that, a whole list of names uh, at 61, Herogar, Hrothgar and Halga the Good, Right. We also get this reference to the Queen of Vanilla, although the name, uh, as the note says, is missing. Um, we also get this reference, you'll see in that note, that says that the Swedish or Schulfing King Ornella appears later in the story, causing much distress to Beowulf's nation. And that's very true. Right. In many ways, this reference to Ornella, this King of the Swedes, is going to presage this conflict between the Swedes and the people to which Beowulf belongs, the, the Yachts, or the Geats. This... Uh, this feud is really going to color the entire story, so we should really keep it in mind. And then we get this uh, introduction to the Great Hall, the Great Hall of Hrothgar, that will be the setting for the early part of the poem, Heorot. And you see in the note that it means heart, uh, and uh, right, heart as in a deer, uh, right? And and it's really conceived of as being this this uh, great hall right it's not just oh it's a drinking hall where you know people drink it's like no it's really supposed to be uh right this great shining edifice again you could maybe compare it to camelot although we'll see the uh comparison there is, is actually quite apt indeed because at line 81 we get this description it says that the hall towered high and horn gabled it awaited hostile fires the surges of war the time was not yet at hand when the sword hate of sworn in-laws should arise after ruthless violence. And the note explains that here. It says the whole Herod is apparently fated to be destroyed in a battle between Hrothgar and his son-in-law, Ingeld, the Hjadvark, a conflict which is predicted by Beowulf in lines uh, 2024 20, to 69. But the battle itself happens outside the action of the poem. So in other words, what we get is a clear indication by the poet that Herod, the whole of Herod, is fated to be destroyed. And as a result of kind of relational violence so between, it seems, Hrothgar and his son-in-law. But it's never, and again, Beowulf also predicts that this will happen, but we never see it. It's never explicitly described in the poem. Well, why is that? Well, it seems that uh, the fate of Herod, the fact that it's doomed to fall, is known to the original, every one of the original audience of this poem. But the poet didn't feel the need to elaborate more on that. The idea is that everyone knew it. So again, to look at a, at a point of comparison, is it could be like Camelot. So if you grow up, uh, you know, in, and are raised in a culture uh, that is participating in the the myth cycle of the Arthurian literature, then you know what the fate of Camelot is. That Arthur is uh, fated to either die or at least go off to Avalon, and that the whole kingdom of Camelot will come to ruin. Right? You know that fate. It doesn't have to. You can make references to it without explicitly describing it. So similarly, it seems that the fate of Herod was so well known in this culture that you didn't have to go into uh, telling that story. You could simply reference it, which means that that doom, that fate hangs over the poem. The fact that Beowulf may save Herod for a moment, but it is eventually going to be destroyed. Okay, so what is he saving 
Herat from? Well, he's saving it from the monster Grendel, who is introduced in the following lines. And is described in some rather interesting ways. So, for instance, at line 101 uh, or so, he's described as a fiend from hell, Theon Don Helda in the original there. And this is this appellation for Grendel seems quite Christian, right? But he's a physical monster. And so, and Grendel bears all the marks of a non-spiritual monster, right? That he has to be slain with a sword. But we'll see that all of these kind of demonic imagery of, of kind of evil spirits is, is applied to him, even if that's not literally the case. And similarly, we get this sense of his origin at lines 106 to 114 or so, right? It says that after the creator had condemned him among Cain's race, when he killed Abel, the eternal Lord avenged that death. And you see the note, that's the story of Cain and Abel told in the Bible in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, where Cain and Abel are the sons of Adam and Eve, the first people, and Cain slays his brother, becoming the first murderer and the first kin slayer. And then there's this story of you know God laying this curse here uh, that does the following. It says, uh, no joy in that feud, that's between Cain and Abel. The maker forced him, uh, that's Cain, far from mankind for his foul crime, right? There's a sense he bore the mark of Cain. From thence arose all misbegotten things, trolls and elves and the living dead, and also the giants who strove against God for a long while. He gave them reward for that. You see the note there saying that the poet lists a collection of Germanic, classical, and biblical horrors. All are ultimately traced to their biblical roots, though the characters in the poem are not aware of this, right? So they don't know the origin. It's the narrator, the kind of Christian narrator kind of interjecting here. But the fact that the poet is drawing from Germanic and classical kind of Greco-Roman uh, as well in terms of uh, giants and things in the biblical tradition as well, right? It he's making it all dependent on this biblical story of Cain and Abel. And this is very much indicative of the poet's approach throughout. So sometimes he'll draw from his own native Germanic culture. Other times he'll draw from something that's maybe more classical um, and other times from something that's explicitly biblical, but he always subordinates it to this biblical tradition and tries to make it fit in. But, it, but these words, if, so if you look at the original, it's Iotnas on the Ilfa on the Orkneas Swilche Gigantas, right? So we have Gigantas, right, which uh, are kind of biblical giants. We have Iotnas, Jotuns, from, you know, if you know Norse mythology, Jotunheim is a place of the frost giants. So they're, they're also kind of giants, but in a more Germanic sense, Ilfa, that's elves, and Orkneas. Now, Orkneas, incidentally, is probably, is where the word orc probably comes from if you're, you know, you know, the Lord of the Rings or any fantasy thing nowadays has orcs in them, it seems. But Orkneas uh, originally meant something like the living dead, almost more like zombies. All right, so we then get in the next section here the attack on the hall by Grendel. Right, we get the sense, uh, especially around lines 30, 134 to 135 or so, that he's returning. To, right, he comes one night and then he comes back again. Right, it was no long wait, but the very next night he committed a greater murder. Uh, more not at all for his feuds and sins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's, it's almost like a kind of fairy tale construction we're getting, right? Because we've had all this historicity, but now we're into a more fairy tale type mode with this idea of this, right? This hall being attacked in successive nights by the monster, and we also get at 154 to 158 the sense that Grendel stands outside the societal bounds of mediation, right? It says that he wanted no peace with any man of the Danish army, nor ceased his deadly hatred, nor settled with money. Nor did any of the counselors need to expect bright compensation from the killer's hand. You'll see the note on that saying that the Germanic and Anglo-Saxon law allowed that a murderer could make peace with the family of his victim by paying compensation, or wear guilt, which means man money, literally. The amount of compensation varied with the rank of the victim. Right? So that's how in this society of feud, that's how you settle things without violence. But Grendel does not exist in society, he is outside of society, so he will pay no man money, he will only kill. And then we get this interesting description, too, like of them not needing to expect bright compensation from the hands of the killer. So this is an example of Lytotes, which I referenced earlier. So Lytotes is a positive and often emphatic statement made by denying something negative. And usually it's basically uh, ironic or dramatic understatement, right? So the fact that he didn't expect bright compensation, right, is, is and we'll see that throughout. And I'll, I'll maybe point it out when we come to it. But these descriptions, right, of of, right, of Grendel, right, there's a sense that he, right, he's described as as a whispering demon, right? It's almost, uh, which is the, it's actually a, a description which is very close to a hell runan is the original word. It's almost like a kind of masculine witch, um, which is, is associated with all these kinds of things. Um, and we see how they react to it, 
uh, it, uh, as well. Like how, how do the how do the uh, Danes react to this uh, assault? Well, we see at lines 170 to 188 how they do. It says that there was that was a deep this attack by Grendel was a deep misery to the Lord of the Danes, crushing his spirit. Many a strong man sat in secret council, considered advice. What would be best for the brave at heart to save themselves from the sudden attacks? At times they offered honor to idols at pagan temples, prayed aloud that the soul slayer might offer assistance in the country's distress. Such was their custom, a hope of heathens. They remembered hell in their minds. They did not know the maker, the judge of deeds. They did not know the Lord God, or even how to praise the heavenly protector, wielder of glory. Woe unto him who must thrust his soul through wicked forests in a fire's embrace. Expect no comfort, no way to change it all. It shall be well for him who can seek the Lord after his death day and find security in the Father's embrace. So what are we to make of this passage? It's a very difficult passage because it appears that what's happening is that the Christian faith of the author is actually intruding into the text. Um, and a text, that for the most part, is devoid of such moral injunctions. Normally, the, the narrator is not condemning the paganism of his characters because it exists in a pre-Christian world. So we, the fact that we have it here is, is, is odd. And some people have tried to explain this as an interpolation right, that was added in later. Um, but we have to remember that there is this disjunct between the world of the poet uh, and the world of the narrator and the world of the characters. They exist now. There's a commonality between them for sure, but there is a sense that he exists outside of it. So while the characters may have recourse to uh, right praying to these gods to try and save them from Grendel, ultimately it's only the narrator who knows that that can't save them. Right, only God can, but they don't know him. Although we'll see that uh, right Beowulf be associated with God in many ways for that very reason. Uh, right, he's he's almost like his agent because he will ultimately uh, free them from this. Uh, struggle of uh, of Grendel, and we see that it is very much a uh, uh, we see it weighing on this character of Hrothgar right at the beginning of section number three. With the sorrows of that time, the son of Hjalfdanas, that's Hrothgar, seethed constantly, and you'll see that very often in uh, Anglo-Saxon poets that they describe emotions, especially those of great grief or injury or frustrated wrath, in terms of a boiling pot, right, boiling and bubbling up and whelming over and seething. And then we start getting our introduction, as it were, to Beowulf. So at, this is about 202 to 203, right? We see that this, this young man is kind of going to be encouraged to go off to fight Grendel. He, he exists in another kingdom. It says that wise men did not dissuade him, that's Beowulf at all, from that journey, that journey to go uh, fight Grendel. And again, that's more traditional Anglo-Saxon understatement. So it's saying that uh, they did not, dissuade him at all it means that they actually encouraged him why did they encourage him is it does it have something to do with maybe right the danger of uh right a young strong warrior in a court and you know trying to encourage him to leave does it have something instead to do with maybe kind of like shield right he wasn't found to be of much account in his youth but now he's going out and proving himself we'll, we'll see we'll consider that a bit more we also get a few more pagan references this idea of auspices right Line 204, uh, that they inspected omens, but again, no comment on it this time, unlike the previous thing. Right? They, they, they don't comment on that aspect of pagan culture. And then at lines 210 to 224, we get a fairly vivid description of uh, the arrival of the yachts in Denmark. The time came, the craft was on the waves, moored on, under the cliffs. Eager men climbed on the prow, the currents eddied, sea against sand. The soldiers bore into the bosom of the ship their bright gear, fine, polished, the men pushed off on their wish for journey in that wooden vessel over the billowing waves, urged by the wind. The foamy-necked floater flew like a bird until in due time on the second day, the curved, proud vessel had come so far. And the seafarers sighted land, shining shore cliffs, steep mountains, wide headlands. Then the wise waves were crossed, the journey at an end. Thence up quickly the people of the wetters climbed into the plain, moored their ship, shook out their mail shirts, their battle garments. They thank God that the sea paths had been smooth for them. So this vivid uh, description, you can almost right, picture and you know, smell the sea and as, as the men pull up in their boat. This is the arrival of Beowulf. So finally, at this point in the poem, after the prologue with S.H.I.E.L.D., after this introduction to the Hall of Heorot and Hrothgar and Grendel, we are going to get the hero himself. 
And what kind of a hero is he? And how is he first described? Uh, we'll look at this and his ultimate confrontation with Grendel in the following video.